Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 106 of the Citrix Session. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. I've got uh, Monica Grismer with me. Monica is on the product um, marketing side at Citrix. Monica, how's it going? Going well. Excited to be back. Absolutely. It's uh, This is part two of a, a two-parter, we hope. Hopefully, we get through the rest of it today. Uh, and we have uh, Todd Smith. Todd is a director of sales engineer for Citrix up in the New England area. Todd's kind of a staple these days on the show or the podcast. I don't know if I should call it a show. Uh, but Todd, welcome back. Thanks, Andy. Glad to be here. So, OK, um, let's try to recap last week briefly. Last week. Uh, so the concept here and Monica did a good job bringing us to this last week um, is they did a webinar on what's new in virtual app and desktops. Uh, which would include the virtual app and desktop product. And it'll also include the service, which as we talked through last week is now called DAS, desktop as a Citrix uh, service. So Citrix DAS. Uh, Todd, Monica, I get that right? Yes. Yep. yep. We're Citrix DAS is the new CVAD service. And yep, we were, we did a webinar, Alan Fermansky and myself, uh, about a month or so ago and got so many great questions that this is the Q&A and amalgamation of all the questions that we got. So some of the answers are straightforward. Some are a little bit lengthier, but excited to dig into the second half of them today. And, and the overall topics for the blog that we're reviewing, again, the blog, well, the blog name is what's new and next with Citrix virtual apps and desktops Q&A. That's the official name. And Monica's the one that put the thing together. It covers, uh, I don't know, about five or six things here. First one was long-term service release, LTSR 2203. Uh, we covered that in a different podcast. We also covered it last week. So go back and listen if you want to. Unified communications and meetings. Lots of stuff covered there in various podcasts uh, that we've done, but specifically we covered what was new. Uh, installation. Do you guys remember exactly how far we made it last week? I believe we only got through the top two. So the last five here we've got to get through, but the sections I believe are a bit shorter. Yeah. Well, we might end up on three parts. <laughs> I guess people just have to live with us. All right. Uh, did anything after you guys went back and digested briefly uh, la about last week, anything about LTSR and unified communications that you wish you would have said? I, I think we covered a, a good amount last week. Um, I'll just say that unified communications, even in, you know, customer conversations that we had over the course of the week still continues to be top dog. So I think that just kind of got reinforced throughout the week. Yeah. I think the big one that's missing for me is um, um, not y'all, not y'all's fault, but uh, Google as an endpoint, Google OS being able to do like team, uh, excuse me, zoom offload it has teams offload. I haven't had a chance to test it yet. I've got a device right here on my desk to test it later today, but uh, zoom offload um, and then all the other players that need to kind of write to those APIs and the uh, web RTCs to be able to make it a reality if they so in, in, indeed want to. Uh, okay, well, that gets us to uh, the next section here around insulation and migration. The first question that came in that you guys answered is the Citrix automation configuration tool, a supported component from Citrix tech support. Should I need to open a case after using that tool? Monica, you want to hit that one? Yeah, the answer to that is yes. So the, the automated configuration tool has been around for a while and has been fully generally available. So that one, I don't know, Todd, how much you've run into it thus far, but it's been a big deal for our customers trying to migrate from on-premises to the cloud. So just making their lives easier. So yeah, if you if you have an issue with that, then you can open a support case because it's fully GA. But But Todd, have you gotten to see that one in action yet? Yeah, I've seen it in action a couple of times uh, with customers that were in the middle of going through a, uh, an upgrade, but they've also used it extensively during troubleshooting and tech support, kind of helping identify what some of the baseline configurations are and compare that to what's being seen in causing a uh, tech support incident. So Todd, does it Okay, so you have situations where I'm sure people don't use it, and you have some situations where they do use it. Is it kind of a no-brainer just to use it in a read-only mode just to see what it would have pulled over if it could? It should be because, you know, one of the requirements that a lot of the compliance programs that the customers are having to deal with are uh, documentation, right? Documentation of your system, documentation of your configuration settings. How do you know what has changed unless you know what, what normal looks like or what the... Uh, configuration should be. Um, so it's a great tool to have around. It's, uh, you know, it, it, 
in my days of doing IT operations, this would, this would be a tool that I would have on my belt on a regular basis and run them, run that read only view, uh, you know, once a month or once a quarter. Yeah. Just see what's changed. Can you use it once you've transitioned to the cloud? Does it still work? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No worries. All right, so uh, next question on here, uh, Monica, I guess I'll just have you answer these and then Todd and I'll chime in. With the okay. automation automation configuration tool, does it actually migrate the MCS gold image or does it just bring in the VDAs? Also, does it leave the on-premises catalog usable or does it actually move it? So the way we answered this question is we, we detailed that the main image is copied for both static VDI and non-static VDI. But in the cases of non-static VDI, the image is the only thing migrated because the VM is stateless. So the on-premises source catalogs always remain usable, usable after migration. And then additionally, we added here, we don't write or do anything to the on-prem site. We just read the data from it. So there's some specific scenarios that our document documentation covers as well. But Todd, I think that's what you're talking about with read only, right? Yeah. Absolutely. This is good for me because I didn't really, I thought it would just handle metadata as it relates to the database you're moving from, say, on premises to the cloud. Does this, I guess you guys are saying it'll actually go grab uh, stateful, uh, persistent images as well as, as well as master machines in a catalog. Is that true? Yes. And, and once again, you know, the product documentation does a great job of confirming in, in those type of questions, but yes, that's the uh, that's the intent is it would be able to grab and uh, migrate all of the uh, all of the um, persistent components. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next one is uh, is the Citrix Image Portability Service compatible with compatible with Citrix application layering? So the answer to that one is yep. Um, they're compatible and tested together. So you have to be using the app layering service or the just using app layering rather to produce images in vSphere. And then you can use those images as an input into image portability service and migrate to either Azure or Google Cloud. I mean, that's, that's really like the main use case for, right? The ability to make it, abstract it from the image and then wherever you need to take the image and these layers, they can go. Agreed. I think we also may have skipped a question. Okay. Well, while we're on this one, the question yep. around the uh, portability service, what today, what's the current state? What is the current status of that in terms of um, what hypervisor, what cloud, what is it really doing? Just at a high level, quick brief synopsis on it. Yeah. So um, it's to ease the, it's to ease image management and then also to the cloud question we are leveraging azure and google cloud and we are also in tech preview for aws as well so basically to migrate the images between whichever clouds you need so i'm, I'm looking here and, and using what i also had thought i knew so if you're going from a vmware vsphere environment you can go to azure and google cloud and maybe potentially aws in a future offering mm -hmm. okay uh, does that require the uh, the VMware uh, the VMC the VMware console on Azure or Google or are you talking native hyperscaler? I'm not sure how it relates to VMware Cloud. I I believe you can do native, but I'm I'm not 100 sure on VMware Cloud. It, it doesn't call it out, so I'd assume we're talking native here. Or yeah. We call it out. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, Monica, you're right. We skipped one. Um, are there plans to simplify initial Citrix virtual app and desktop installation for on-premises managed environments, fewer installer scripts, blah, 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 all the stuff that we've been working on all these years, or is it like, Hey man, just move to the cloud. Right. I mean, that was going to be kind of my plug that latter half of the question that you asked yeah. for those of you listening in the, the question isn't written like that, but incredible point, Andy. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a baseline required amount of MSI installers to get your on-premises environment to work. You can make scripts to make it easier, maybe through a tool like SCCM. But at the end of the day, if you if you really want to offload management and streamline deployments, then the cloud's the way to go. That's that's what we've been talking about for probably way too long now. But 
that's oh. that's the easier answer. There are still people that don't get it, and I'll chime in here. So I was able to talk to your team early, early on about Citrix Cloud, um, and I was against it primarily because I run a consulting business and I need the complicated base install. Uh, you know, that was selfish of me. And, and then as I started talking to customers and realized they never got this rolled out correctly or they, they just couldn't get from version one to version two because it was too much of a heavy lift and they never rolled it out in multiple data centers. So they had no version of redundancy. You know, I just had to get to the point where, look, this is just too valuable for customers to, to not have it uh, as a platform and be able to bring in all that extensibility and grow their company and their, their technology to support it. So it, you know, only took me a month or two or three to realize this is something that just, you just can't keep doing it the old way. At some point, everything as a cloud service, specifically a platform as a service, it just becomes the better way to do it. Right. If, and I appreciate if I it. If I had to compare it to some of my life, it's like I used to have to get a is an app and a car comes and picks me up and I don't even have to talk to the driver anymore. It's just better. Go ahead. Sorry. Right. I was thinking about that the other day. We had a slide that was, it talks about you used to not meet strangers from the internet and not get into strangers' cars. And now we beckon strangers from the internet to get in their cars. So and get, it's and get, the world show up and, and get mad when they don't show up in two minutes. I had right, a, exactly. uh, I was coming from uh, Minnesota to the airport. I was going to Minneapolis, St. Paul to the airport the other day. And I scheduled an Uber and I scheduled it for 4.30 a.m. And I was so mad. But at the end of the day, I realized it was my fault, not theirs. Just another example where I had the analytics to go back and, and, and actually what happened at 4.30 the next afternoon, it started pinging me, say, hey, he's on his way. And I'm like, oh, crud, that was my fault, not his. <laughs> right. Pro prove where the user error was. That's right. All you got to be is open-minded and now you have the data to prove it was my fault. <laughs> In the past, I just always blamed everybody else. Sure. All right. Next question. Uh, is the VDA upgrade service available on server VDAs or desktop VDAs? So the VDA upgrade service is available for both server and desktop VDAs as long as they are persistent. So the VDA upgrade service is really about streamlining that management of the VDA upgrade specifically for on-premises deployments without using third-party tools or scripts. So when you use the, when you install the VDA, add the upgrade agent as an additional component. And you can do that either via either a command line or the GUI on the machine catalog. And then you can enable the VDA upgrade feature and select your VDA type. Mm -hmm. So it's for both. So this is going to allow me to automate the VDA staying up to date so that that's no longer my, my, my issue either? Yes, I mean, I, it's to ease that process. Um, there is a bit of upfront things that you have to do, obviously, to, to ensure that works. But yeah, it's to ease the upgrade process on-prem. So Todd, in a, um, in a persistent image world, totally get it. Uh, people that have uh, master images, do they just fire them up every so often and let them go phone home? Yeah, that would be the suggestion, right? So you, you, you every period, well, periodically you would go and, uh, you know, open up your master image, allow the updates to occur, create a new or promote that, up, that updated master image to be your new master and then be able to uh, run off of that. Yeah. Um, it eliminates a lot of the extra steps of bringing a, uh, you know, a non-persistent image and having it apply everything into a, you know, basically to a uh, scratch disc. Yeah. Wow. I did it myself on that one. Scratch disc. Yeah. It's an old mainframe term, Andy, back in the day. Man, I, I, I didn't even get that one. Um, okay. Uh, I'd like to talk more about that one, but we'll, we can talk later around persistent images. There's probably a blog out there at some point talks about all the good, the good and the bad of persistent images. See a ton of it out there from people that rolled out generation one BDI that are now trying to get away from it. Yep. And, and a lot I of them that haven't, up, the that haven't gone through a major redesign. They haven't gone through an update in this. They, they installed VDI when it was, you know, the, the brand new thing and they haven't touched it in, in terms of being able to, to modify it and bring it up to the current state, right? So they're missing out on a lot of these features and functionalities that uh, that if you were doing a brand new install today, you would get a much different VDI experience, much more, you know, for, in terms of performance, but more importantly, out of, you know, efficiency. 
Yeah, I mean, those same people that had massive success with persistent VDI rollouts probably couldn't have done it, well, not easily, with non-persistent. Now those problems that existed have been solved with WIM and things like uh, FS Logics and other pieces, app layering potential. Um, it's time to revisit that, but no, no doubt they, they had more success probably than some of the other folks trying to do it the right way. Um, you know, they, they, they had, they had the issue where they brought a bunch of bad stuff with them when they did it that way, bad, bad practices, yep. uh, how they can fix that. All right. Uh, will it be possible for profile to be automatically migrated from one VDA to another? If a VDA is put into maintenance mode, we are using server 2016 as there are 0365 issues with 2019. Will it be possible for a profile to be automatically migrated from one VDA to another? I'm scared of this question. Yeah, so I, this one is kind of getting into roaming profiles, right? So when you're using a roaming, roaming profile with server 2016, admins can configure different VDAs. So in maintenance mode or not, to load the same user profile. So if one VDA goes into maintenance mode, they will log into another VDA by this Citrix virtual apps and desktops mechanism and CPM will load the same profile. But if you're looking at profile containers, if the VDA is in maintenance mode and continues to load the VHD, there will be an issue for the second login on a different VDA, but it could be easily solved by logging off the user on that machine with maintenance mode. And then lastly, we mentioned a similar workaround can be completed if using FS logics containers or office containers. And, and I think what threw me for the loop is it's been so long since I used Citrix Profile Manager to become SF, FS Logics in every opportunity we work on these days, plus WIM, of course, mm -hmm. uh, that I didn't, like, I couldn't even understand the question. And, yeah. and Andy, I, th I think one of the biggest questions that comes out of this is, okay, well, why does it take so, you know, when I'm doing a migration from a, a different version of a profile management solution, why do I have to go through a couple of extra steps along the way? And sometimes you can't update, you can't provide an update or make a change until the base has been altered as well, right? So, you know, you look at it when you do a Windows update just on, a, just on your desktop OS, right? You're, there's certain updates that cannot be performed until some other update has completed, you've rebooted the machine, and then it goes out and finds hey, here's a whole bunch of other things, other updates that you're now eligible for based on the fact that you just performed an update. The profile goes through a very similar process, right? You have to go through and allow the, the profile to reset itself or to accept those updates before it can start making those long-term changes. Yeah. All right, um, guys, that moves us on to the next topic area of user experience, which other than security, user experience is number one, and you could argue user experience is number one, security is number two. Either way, they're both at the top. Uh, first question, does Citrix Workspace app support multiple monitors with different resolutions? So the answer to that one is absolutely. So we have multi-monitor support at different resolutions, differs based on platform. I'd say what the Windows, the workspace app for Windows gets everything first. So um, definitely if you're using a, a Windows device, you've got this, but then you can look at the documentation and support for differing workspace app models. And then we have a support article on that. But yep, we've had support for multiple monitors for, for a while now, I believe, at least on workspace app for Windows. Well, and then the key here is multiple monitors with, with different resolutions. Resolutions, yep. And even that's been fixed for quite a long time. Todd, is it still limited to eight or is that higher these days, monitors? I believe it's still limited to eight. I haven't seen anyone try to use more than eight. Um, even the traders on Wall Street are, uh, <laughs> are not doing eight. Um, but, you know, the key there is that the different resolutions, oftentimes that's a hardware restriction um, on the endpoint device, whatever you're plugging it into. So if you're using a monitor splitter or a, a video splitter in there where it takes the lowest of the lowest common denominator when it comes to uh, resolution. Um, you know, there, there's different, there's different ways to approach that. Yeah. And, and Todd, do you know, or Monica, either one, what the highest resolution supported is at this point? I, 
I've not pushed it. I, I'm too cheap to buy really nice monitors, but what is the highest resolution? If you know, if you don't, that's fine. I don't know at the moment. Maybe, yeah, I'll have to double check on that one. Todd, you know? I don't, I believe it's 4K is still the highest resolution that we support, but I'm not sure the, you know, the sizing. Um, it was right when I asked that question, I realized there was a link in here that says. That 3840 said, by 260, I believe. Yep. Com most common is 1920 by 1080. And then mm -hmm. 3840 by 2160, what Todd just said, or 2160p. Yep. I think all that ties back into what marketing calls 4K resolution. And then we've got the reiterate support for eight monitors. Yep. yep. I, I'd like to see more than eight. I, I truly think that would be, that'd be a sight to behold. I think I've seen six, a trader in Wall Street kind of moment. That was it. All right, uh, next question under user experience. With Citrix Analytics for performance, are the endpoint stats only available for the cloud environments or for on-premises as well? Yep, so this one's reiterating that both cloud and on-premises environments are supported. So we've got some documentation for additional information, but yeah, I think that's just important in general to reiterate that you can use our analytics across on-premises and cloud environments. And when you do that, right, you have to have a Citrix ADM in play so that you're on-premises. Um, so, okay, so if you're using on-premises workloads, but you're coming through Citrix Cloud, that's a no-brainer. That's just going to work, right? And then if you have yes. uh, your on-premises Citrix um, um, ADCs talking to what I used to call ADM, and I'm going to clarify my acronyms there, uh, that's reporting up to the cloud and analytics can work for that as well, right? Correct. Did I use the right acronym? Yep. Yeah, and, and the critical thing there, Andy, is that, you know, you can get some basic network information out of native performance analytics without an ADM connection, but if you really want to get down into the, the details, you want to have that ADM service up and running as well. And Todd, ADM stands for what? Application Delivery Management. And the key in all this is the ability for that system to be able to see inside the uh, I'm going to call it IC ICA protocol, but for the sake of the marketing guys, listen, HDX protocol. Uh, yep. That's the key, right? Being the only company that can truly unlock it and see it all. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So now we've moved on to security and authentication. Uh, for Citrix Workspace app, are there any plans to integrate Windows Hello and domain pass-through authentication? Go ahead, Monica. Yeah. So, um we actually do support Windows Hello in certain scenarios, I believe for sure on Workspace app for Windows, which makes sense because it's Windows Hello. Um, and it's we give the guidance to check with your local partner or Citrix rep for more details to prioritize. So I think the stitch here is maybe the domain pass through. So we're always working on different forms of authentication and maybe that one is the sticking point at the moment. Well, and that was my fault. I asked the question wrong. I inserted the wrong. Let me reread the question. For Citrix Workspace app, are there any plans to integrate Windows Hello with domain pass-through authentication? I used an. It's with domain pass-through. So, yes, the whole thing. Hello with domain mm -hmm. pass-through um, authentication in, in tow. Yep. So, I like I said, we, we have support for Windows Hello, but it's the domain pass-through that I think we're, we're working on. Yeah. And I can tell you firsthand, uh, Zintegra is looking to go passwordless. So we'll use Hello Camera and other biometrics things. So we're we're doing it for our own. We're, we're, we're weird, right? We're a Citrix partner that actually uses the stuff. And I know my guys are in the process and I will be one of the guinea pigs when we get to that point in the, uh, in the coming months. All right, uh, what level of vTPM is supported in 2203? So that would be long-term service release uh, 2203, which would be you know, March of this year uh, for use with Windows 11 as the VDI platform. So the Citrix VDA software will run within a vTPM enabled Windows 11 VM, as well as a VM with Azure Trusted Launch. So you can use MCS to provision VMs with the VTPM enabled by Azure Trusted Launch. So all of that is fully tested and supported, but for the specific features that are within the Windows OS, 
that are enabled by via VTPM or Azure Trusted Launch, that's handled on a case-by-case -case basis and we're testing compatibility. Yeah. Todd, anything on this one? Yeah, it, it's, you know, once again, this is, as we're continuing to test, we'll be uh, probably publishing out what we've tested and, you know, what, what product features. That's why it's very important that the, the uh, Keep an eye on the, pro on the publicly facing product roadmap and also the what's new uh, blog information and what's new articles um, because we're you know this is a this is an area for Citrix that is constantly evolving and it's partially based on you know uh, all of our uh, vendor partners are coming up with new ways of enabling security features or launching new capabilities um, so it's really important to watch. Uh, Watch what's out there as far as what's new and, and roadmap information. So, Todd, is the key here validating, verifying that the, the machine hasn't been altered, even though yeah. it's a virtual machine in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, and that's that, that's the key, right? Because it's, it's looking at it from both a hardware perspective as well as the the operating system and all the other applications, and that's kind of what the, the TPM capabilities used to have. Uh, you know, you plug in a USB device and it alters your TPM score um, or ch changes what the default behavior should be. Um, you you want to be able to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with and be able to adjust if it has, right? So is it something that we want to uh, restrict what people can do? Um, or do you want to just basically say, hey, you know what, we're going to put this into quarantine mode and you're not going to get on here until it's been resolved. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't really thought about this in cloud or hosted scenarios, but, you know, some, somewhere, someday, or I'm sure already people are attacking from this angle and you want to be able to validate that nothing has, nothing has changed in that systems configuration each time it launches. Uh, next one says for Citrix session recording, aka smart auditor for the older guys, uh, can you capture both video recordings and events in a log file, uh, specifically file transferring? Yep. Um, so with session recording, you can either capture full video or specified events. So this is relatively new um, because we have added event logs so like it says it can say however many events have happened and we've also recently added dynamic e recording based on events so a specific event might trigger the recording to start so you're not just getting the full file of a session so you don't have to have that full um, amount of storage right that full file stored on your device and so this has been a really big deal and something that i don't know if a lot of our you know, users and customers know about and admins know about is how dynamic we have made session recording now. And then also I'll add my two cents in here because I, I work with this team a lot. They are doing a ton of work with um, cloud services as well. So, so moving the playback console has been in a web form. Um, the, we've got a web-based playback console for recordings and then moving the management console to the cloud as well. So there's been a lot of strides in session recording. So Todd, is this limited to uh, is this limited to the uh, Windows logs, or can we point to any type of text file or log and and use that as our gauge for when to turn on recording? Yeah, it, it, there's a huge list of different recording types that you can do based on triggering those recordings, right? So whether it's uh, opening up a text file, opening up a Word document, uh, going to a specific URL, or launching launching a browser, um, those can all be triggering events, and those can also uh, launch additional uh, recording types, right? So mm -hmm. one of the biggest challenges that people have with session recording is, you know, at first you wanted to record just the application. That was our original intent. And then all of a sudden you brought it into people running an entire desktop. Well, recording an entire desktop session is uh, somewhat of a challenge. So being able to filter that down has been incredibly uh, useful and important for us. But it's also become important for our customers because not only are they doing session recording for safety measures, you know, process management, things like that, but they're also using session recording to, to do some training, right? So employee education, uh, whether it be quality control or quality assurance on the, on the processing side, but also it could be 
a way to ramp up someone very quickly. It's not just the audit use case that session recording was originally intended for. Yeah. Well, and that's been my point all along is it's either for uh, security and audit purposes, or it could be very much used for job training. And I don't think enough people think of it as job training opportunity. I mean, imagine all these years of, well, imagine a support case. We're like, hey, I keep having this thing happen. All right, we're going to turn on session recording. And we're going to capture it versus you trying to explain to the guy who answers the phone on the other end what's happening. They can just watch the video. Oh, I see it now. I know exactly what you're talking about. Boom, here's your fix done. Yep. All right. Uh, next section of the article talks about public cloud. So that would be for the most part, I think we're going to talk about um, the, the three hyperscalers, whether that's uh, Google, GCP, Microsoft, Azure, and um, um, Amazon AWS. I didn't say them in any certain order for any reason, but first question is how can Citrix DAS uh, customers leverage the Google Cloud control plane? So not Google Cloud Platform, which would be their IaaS, but the control plane. Monica, mm -hmm. you want to take that? Yep. So obviously we kind of took this as using the Google Cloud control plane in tandem with Citrix as we're, we're talking about Citrix deployments here. So we are definitely continuing to expand our partnership with Google as well as Azure and AWS. But in regards to Google, we announced DAS Standard and DAS Premium for Google Cloud. And they are deployed in the Citrus Cloud control plane that's hosted on Google Cloud in the US region. So if you want to leverage Google Cloud control plane, you need to purchase the new Citrix DAS for Google Cloud licenses. And we don't currently have the migration mechanism. So it's specifically tied to those additions currently. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you would go into the Google control plane and actually manage the Citrix, um, the Citrix cloud platform? I believe so. Yep. Okay. So it's running on the Google. Yeah, it's running on Google cloud. That's pretty tight. Look, I talk to people all the time and talk about Citrix and Azure, Azure without Citrix. And we talk about Google and Citrix and there's literally just a, a massive need in both companies' directions. You know, Citrix doesn't have a hyperscaler. Google doesn't have a, a Windows solution. And the two of you guys coming together it's just a no-brainer for me. Yep. Agreed. All right. When is the new Azure Change VM settings going to be available? So I believe this change was already already happened in February. And yep. so it's, you know, again, we get cus questions straight from customers and sometimes they, they miss stuff. I know Todd, we were plugging the what's new content earlier, but sometimes it's it's hard to see what all comes out. So we were just directing them that that had already been working. And if it's not to, to contact their account manager, Citrix partner. Well, and, and I'm gonna hit, hit, hit on something here, Monica, is mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you can subscribe to get notified when uh, when we update any of those what's new documents, right? So you can you can subscribe to the page as an example, get those notifications, um, so you don't miss you don't run the risk of missing any out any of this new information. Or you can reach out to uh, your trusted partner like Zintegra to get uh, get some of that information on a, a regular update. Todd, I love that you have your marketing hat on today. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, that was mind, great. That's, that's why we do these podcasts. Totally. And Part of the reason we do this podcast so I can get caught up on stuff that I don't know and I live in this world, it's impossible to keep up. Yep. That's, it, yeah. it, it takes a village. It really does. And then one more plug, you can also subscribe to the blogs as well. So you can subscribe, I believe, by region or by topic. Um, I think they've been working on streamlining that process even more, but I get an email at the top of every week and there's things that I even miss that... and. Again, we all live in this universe, but sometimes we live in different corners of it. So it's our so, full time job and we can't keep up. <laughs> you know. All right. So just uh, we're going to there's going to have to be a part three. I just scrolled down, looked at the miscellaneous section, which looks very juicy and nice. Uh, that's going to be part three. Uh, all right. So in Azure, quick deploy are certain VM sizes only supported in specific regions. So the answer to that is yes. Um, but there are many VM sizes available in different Azure regions, but not all support all VM types. So we have a listing of what we support. And then for unique cases, customers can use their own Azure subscription and deploy in any Azure region. So there's dependencies on the Microsoft front and on the Citrix front. So it's mostly like case by case basis. You have to check it out. 
Yeah, that would be the typical uh, classic consulting answer of depends mm -hmm. because that's what it really comes down to, right? There are there are a couple of factors here that get, can influence the answer to that question. Um, so once again, keep up to date on the uh, product occupation. I'm sure uh, Andy and his team at the Invega would be more than happy to help sort through that. Yeah, I would have to phone a friend on that one. But the, the nice thing about all the cloud and cloud platform stuff, there's fewer it depends, but there's still almost an infinite number of it depends. All right, uh, next one here talks about our old friend, Todd's old friend for sure. Um, is Citrix, is, is, I'm going to use all, I'm going to use my words here, is Citrix provisioning services, aka PVS, I mean, that one's, that one's so synonymously used and that people don't even call it provisioning service. It's always PVS uh, on Azure. So is, is PVS on Azure available on Azure Marketplace? Todd, this is, this is your baby. Yeah, so. absolutely. So yes, PVS is available on Azure today for, uh, with Citrix Dads. Um, there are some manual steps, though, that you have to go through for the PVS server configuration. And we're looking to simplify that. Of course, it's a little bit easier um nowadays with some of the, the scripting and i think we, we look back at one of the prior questions that we uh talked about about you know process automation and eliminating those hundred step run books that used to be out there in the world um you know constantly looking to, to improve that process and once again give a give a plug here for our product documentation um to get more information right so this is an area that uh, because it is running in Azure, it can be updated fairly quickly. Um, so keep an eye out on that product documentation on it to see if there's anything that's new that's changed in that world. Yeah. I will awesome. also add just a specific to this question. It says on Azure Marketplace. So just to say that it's it's a part, it's a capability within Citrix DAS. So you need to have Citrix DAS licenses to go get this to work. You can't just go buy PBS. So just wanted to mention that as well. You got to... You got to bring the, the chicken first, then you can have the egg. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I know Citrix has some thoughts on doing some things as a uh, Azure native uh, offering. I wonder if this could be one of them someday, but certainly you're boxing yourself in if you're not considering Citrix as a way to extend the Azure virtual desktop world beyond what Azure virtual desktop platform, the provisioning piece can do. Well, guys, uh, I want to pause this here. I know Todd's got a hard stop in a few minutes, and uh, we got a late start because of my crazy schedule. But Monica, Todd, thanks, thanks for jumping on, and I'll get this one posted, and we'll do a we'll do a part three either next week or whatever meets y'all's schedule. Yeah, Great. looking forward to the miscellaneous section. It's kind of it's going to be the grab bag <laughs> next like time. The, uh, it's kind of like the cliffhanger for everybody. Yeah, exactly. You never know what you're going to get. I'll, I'll do this for Monica to see your facial expression. It's kind of like the Dukes of Hazard jumping from one side of the ditch to the other. Mm, yeah. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? I do. I know exactly what you're talking about. You see the movie or the TV show? I've seen the movie. Okay. You've seen the TV show? I don't think I've seen the TV show, but uh, I know what uh, you're talking about. Todd, what'd you do on Friday nights when you were a kid? Dukes of Hazard. Waited for Dukes of Hazard to come on. Then we'd go out on our bicycles and try to replicate all of those jumps and realize that. There's a little bit of movie magic going on in there. Right. Yeah, they destroyed a lot of cars. And, and Todd, you, when, you, when you did those jumps, what kind of helmet were you wearing? You know, helmets? <laughs> we, don't, we don't need helmets. I grew up in Southern Ohio. We, we were lucky to, uh, I was talking with my brother this, about this a couple of weeks ago, Andy, and I said, no, you know, we're, we're in our 50s and we're lucky to be alive. Oh. Some of the stupid things we did as kids, we shouldn't be around. I think there's still more of that than you'd think. I, I grew up in central Illinois, and sometimes you just get creative. Creative, I'll use in air quotes. Boredom spawns creativity, Monica. Yep, <laughs> that it does. And I think a lot of it, Todd, a helmet wouldn't have helped, but a few things, the helmet would have helped. Yes. All right, guys, appreciate you joining. We'll do it again next week. All right, thank yeah, you. Thank you.